okay, so this looks like it's set up to go. Okay, I'm talking about dragonflies tonight, as you know, and in case you thought they were anything <laughs> like butterflies, they really are not. They have four wings and they're insects. Actually, they have very similar anatomy to butterflies, just wildly modified for a different mode of life. And when you see a bed of flowers, you think of butterflies. When you see butterflies, you think of, of a bed of flowers. Uh, dragonflies are, oh, what is this doing? This, this, I hate this. this. This was a beautiful photo of a mountain lake with a faint image of a dragonfly behind it. And this is what I get when I put it on the computer. Isn't that weird? So who get that? So that was supposed to be a wetland. Basically, there was a beautiful wetland there. And the idea is that when you see a wetland, it's dragonflies you're looking at, OK? <laughs> so dragonflies are, in, are insects in the order Odonata, uh, equivalent to the butterfly order Lepidoptera. Uh, because of that, we call them odonates. And I like to use that word because I sort of use that as shorthand for dragonflies plus damselflies. In, the, in Britain, uh, damselflies are dragonflies. They don't even have the word damselflies. All odonata are dragonflies. And then there are various groups of damselflies within that. In North America, we very definitely separate them out, both in sort of uh, uh, biology, professional biology, and amateur naturalists usually think of dragonflies and damselflies as rather different creatures. But so when I'm talking about both of them, I very often use the term odonates. So there are two suborders in this order, very well defined, and that's why they have two different common names. Uh, the damselflies are the smaller, more slender ones. Their forewings and hindwings are essentially the same, very, very similar. Couldn't really see any difference between them. The eyes are relatively small and well separated uh, by more than their own diameter. And most damselflies perch with their wings closed, not all. Dragonflies, on the other hand, by the way, this means yoke wings. Zygo is yoke, yoke wings. The wings sort of fold together in damselflies. Dragonflies, anisoptera, this just means unlike wings. Uh, have the forewings and the hindwings quite differently shaped. The hindwings are much broader than the forewings. Uh, a lot of different aspects of venation in them. Dragonflies generally are larger and more robust, although in fact the odonate with the largest wing spread in the world is a damselfly. And some of the smallest odonates are dragonflies. Uh, so, but anyway, dragonflies generally are larger and more robust, certainly the case in Washington. And the eyes are larger, and they're either touching in most cases, or at least they're closer together than their own diameter, unlike damselflies. And then, of course, all of our dragonflies perch with their wings open. Uh, there are a few tropical dragonflies that actually perch with their wings closed, but they're very much the exception. So if you're going to study dragonflies and learn about them, you really need to start with the larva. Uh, just as in butterflies, the larva plays a very, very important role in the life. It may dominate the life cycle. The larva may take up much of the time, much of the annual life cycle, with the adult only flying for a week, two weeks, a month, and the larva being present for the rest of the year. Sometimes the larva takes more than one year to grow, and some dragonflies in cold, high latitude rivers and streams, uh, they have been reported taking as long as eight years to reach adult, the adult stage. Uh, in other tropical dra uh, dragonflies that breed in temporary, very warm, temporary waters. Uh, the, larva, the entire larval growth may happen in less than a month, so tremendous variation there. So the larva is also called nymph or naiad. Uh, many of my colleagues refuse to use the word larva. They say that their dragonflies are so different that we want to call them nymphs. So there's actually a kind of a battle going on in odonatology, whether to use the word larva and nymph, and so both of them are used a lot. Naiad is a, use, a, a word used especially for dragonfly, larvae, nymphs, but it's not really used very much. So this is a larva. It's a typical insect. It's got three parts, a head, a thorax that bears all the legs, and the abdomen behind that. And one of the most special things about the larva is its rectum. This is what I call the miraculous rectum. There aren't very many organs in animals that serve three extremely different functions, very distinct and different functions. And one of these functions is digestion, as you would expect a good rectum to do. It's mostly absorption, actually. A lot of the digestion happens in the foregut. And then as the nutrients come through here, they're absorbed by the, intest by the uh, 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 intestinal wall or rectum wall. The other thing is respiration. There's a hole right here, the anus. And water can be taken in and out. They, they can actually compress the abdomen in such a way to pull water in there and push it out again. And so. To, doing that, they're bringing in fresh water. And these are the gills 
all these branch structures in this very large chamber are the gills, and so that's where respiration takes place. Oxygen is absorbed through those, carbon dioxide is excreted and pushed out the rear end. Because water can be pushed out the rear end, it can actually be pushed out very rapidly, and it's used then for locomotion. They can squeeze it, squirt water out, and squirt the dragonfly forward at the same time. And if you do any collecting of larval dragonflies, you'll see that with no trouble at all. They often move like that, squirting little jets of water out the rear end. So pretty, pretty neat. And the uh, oxygen that's absorbed from the water, taken into the gills, runs through a tracheal system. And so these tubes you see are actually tracheal, so it's very different from a vertebrate where our oxygen and carbon dioxide travel through our blood. In this case, it travels through tubes of air, essentially. It's a gas as it goes through the body, and it goes all through the body. These are the big main trachea here, but they actually go out the legs, up into the head, up to the eyes, uh, throughout the body, smaller and smaller divisions of those carrying oxygen to different parts of the body for respiration. Butterflies are all vegetarians, pretty much. Dragonflies are emphatically not. There's not a vegetarian among them. All dragonfly larvae are carnivorous. All dragonfly adults are carnivorous. So in that, their niches are extremely different in the insect world. And that would explain a lot of the differences between the two groups. Uh, this is a, a side view of a dragonfly larva. These are wing pads developing here. The wings of the adult develop within the larva. And the head and the thorax and so forth. And this is the labium. The structure. This actually comes from the, the bottom of the head here, comes out to here, is hinged right here, and comes out to here, and it's sort of called a labial mask that covers the face. And that's what they use to catch their prey, called a killer lip there. And if we uh, stretch one out and look at it from the top view, this is one now extended. It's got these labial palps that actually are, are, are unhinged as well. They can open up. So this sees a prey item, and it, it shoots that out very, very rapidly that and it's like this and it catches something say right in here and it folds and brings it back to the mandibles and starts chewing it up so all these CT these little hairs are all to help it hold on to something grab it and pull it in so there's one with the labium stretched out a totally different kind of larva but you can see that would be a pretty effective prey catcher there shot out grab pull back to the mandibles uh, this is a, a darner, our big common blue dragonflies all around here in the family, Eshinidae, the darners. Uh, they're quite different. They, they're, they, uh, the ones that I say this kind here sits in the mud and basically is a sit and wait predator. And as something comes by, it senses something with its eyes or with its antennae or with its legs. The legs are sticking out to the side and it turns and orients toward that prey item. And when it gets within range, its eyes can actually fixate it. When it gets to be just the right range, then the labium shoots out, so the prey never knows what hit it. And so lots and lots of sit and wait predators and dragonflies, perhaps the majority of them are like that. This is a stalking predator. The darners are very different. They actually see their prey at a distance and move toward it, stalk it like a cat stalking a mouse, and eventually can grab it. And they've got a very different sort of labium. This is the underside of a darner. It's flat. It's got palps here that aren't, they don't, they're not for enfolding. They're really for stabbing and grabbing something and pulling it back. So something like this common green darner can very easily catch a tadpole or a fish with a labium like that. Stalks it, gets close enough, bam. And if you look at, if you uh, key out dragonfly larvae, you'll see a tremendous variation in the, the length and size and structure of the labium. Some of the darners have a labium that's really short and fat. Presumably they catch their prey at really close range. Some of them have ones very long and thin. Presumably they catch their prey at a, at a greater range. And we know almost nothing about that. There is so much interesting research to be done with dragonfly larvae yet just to learn why, why they vary as they do in, in simple structure, functional morphology, in other words. Damselfly larvae are quite different. Like the adults, they're smaller, more slender, more delicate. Uh, they don't have a gills in the rectum, but in fact, they have their gills at the rear end. These are external gills, also called lamellae, and respiration is done through them. They've got trachea running right out into the gills. Uh, if, you, if they lose their gills, something grabs them and they drop all three gills, they can still live, they can still respire. Apparently they do have some means of respiring in the abdomen, but most of the respiration is done with these gills. They're sort of double function. They're used also for locomotion, just like a fish tail. So here's another kind of damp supply larvae from the side. That's how they spread them out when they're uh, getting fresh water 
pulling oxygen into the body, and they can swim very, very well with those as well. Again, the wing pads on the, on the larva here, uh, when they get to be that large, you know they're in the last stage, or instar it's called, <clears throat> from tiny, tiny things that hatch out of the egg, they, they go undergo about 10 to 12 molds, twice as many as butterflies do at least, uh, and they may develop for quite a long time. And when they get to a certain, and that, when they get to a certain size, uh, then they stop feeding at some point and they're ready to emerge. Uh, we all know butterflies have, in addition to the egg, and I should really have listed the egg here, uh, they have three developmental stages: the larva when they feed and grow, uh, the pupa when they are transformed within that to the adult butterfly, and finally the adult, like these, these are all stages of monarchs here. Dragonflies are different, they only have two stages, a larva or a nymph stage and the adult, they don't have the pupal stage. What they do is while they're inside the larva, they're actually transforming, or the larva itself is transforming to an adult uh, as it goes about its daily business. A rather different situation than in butterflies and higher insects. Uh, since the butterflies evolved after the dragonflies, presumably it was, uh, evolution decided the pupa was a better way to go, but these more primitive insects have done a fine job of it for millions and millions of years. This is a, a dragonfly larva molting. Uh, <coughs> When they come out of their uh, cast skin here, they're white and pigmentless. Uh, as far as I know, insects don't have albinos. If you see a white insect, it's probably because it just molted and it hasn't developed its pigment yet. And almost any insect that molts comes out without pigment very, very quickly. The, the pigment hardens up, or very, very quickly, the insect hardens and the pigment is deposited. So, so this is what you see coming out of, of the uh, critter that has just molted. Just about white, it will very rapidly develop pigment. Again, a, a darner larva, big larva, big wing pads uh, extending back on the abdomen here, the eyes very prominent, the antennae. Uh, here's a larva of a common white tail, very common dragonfly around here, just a typical larva. This is a sit and wait predator. It's, it's got a lot of hairs on it and algae and plant material adhere to it. It sits down in the mud. Its eyes are right at the top of the head, so it's very well adapted for lurking in the mud uh, and eating the things that are crawling around there. So while this is in the water now, moving around, once it gets to the last instar, the last larval stage, uh, as almost as soon as it has done that mold very quickly, it starts reassembling its body inside. It's actually changing to the adult dragonfly while it's escaping <coughs> predators, while it's feeding, while it's moving around. Uh, at some point, the adult mouth parts, which are much smaller than that great big killer lip of the larva, withdraw from the labium of the larva, and then it can't feed anymore. And once that's, that, that happens, then it's, again, an adult inside there, still moving around, uh, starts crawling up to the surface, and actually <coughs> starts sort of breathing both air and water. It has a time of transition when it moves between taking in water to its gills and actually breathing air. So you'll often see them sometimes at the surface, sometimes upside down, which is the tip of their abdomen sticking out. Very quickly, they crawl up on a branch. They're ready to emerge. Again, you can see the wing pads of this. This is another uh, common white tail larva. Crawls up, just sits there for a while, probably adapting to the air. It's breathing air. It's uh, just getting ready to go. It's got this larva, in, this adult inside it now. It's flexing its muscles. It's developing more of its adult traits and breaks out finally. They've actually got a, a sharp point on the top of the thorax, which is where the larval skin breaks open. It actually probably rubs that somehow against there and pops it open and then it just splits wide out. And the adult sticks its head out and basically rests. Once it comes out, it rests. Mm -hmm. These tubes are the, the same trachea that you saw in the larva. Uh, they're made of the same, uh, they're part of the same embryonic uh, development uh, area or, or uh, tissue uh, as the external uh, cuticle. And so they're actually pulled out every time the dragonfly mm -hmm. molds as the larger tubes. So that's what you're seeing there. And so now this just rests here, basically has to let its muscles develop and it's flexing its legs a little bit. But just, it, can, it may hang there for 20, 30 minutes even. And then finally it reaches up and pulls itself out and then it starts expanding. And so this one, its wings are starting to expand from the base. Its abdomen has expanded a little bit. It's already quite a bit bigger than the larva. And the wings expand from the base, and they expand until they're all the way full size. 
and then the, the fluids that have been used to expand those wings go back into the abdomen and expand the abdomen. And so then the abdomen expands all the way and then it's full size, a much, much larger looking creature than was living in there. So it's a fluid that, that is pumped into the wing to make it expand, yes. then goes back out? Into the abdomen to make that expand, right. And then finally, it's a perfectly good dragonfly. It crawls away from its exuberance. This one emerged in a pond in my backyard. Uh, it took it mm, about an hour and 40 minutes. And at the end of that time, it, and its wings finally popped open. The wings are closed when they emerge. They finally pop open, and it flies up into the air and disappears. And that's typical of Udenata in general. That's what they do. Here's another sequence of another species emerging. This is a dragon hunter, a very large dragonfly in eastern North America, crawling up on a rock, splitting the exoskeleton. And this one now is not hanging down like the other one did. It's actually up, pointing up. There's two different types of, of, of uh, emergence, ones that actually hang off the larva or the cast skin, and ones that are sticking up like this, which are being supported with their own muscular musculature. So then it comes out, it's sitting, resting for a while, pulls itself out, the wings start expanding, wings expand, then the abdomen expands, and eventually it's ready to fly away. The reason it's green is because insect blood is green. So you're actually seeing bodily, precious bodily fluids there, they are real color. Why do they call it a dragonfly? Oh, because it eats other dragonflies. Thank you for asking. Yeah. It's, it's one of the very largest North American dragonflies. And its larva is a, a flat thing that looks just like a dead leaf that lives on the edge of streams and mimics, mimics a dead leaf. These are damselflies that have just emerged. Uh, they're, they're in different stages here. This one is still expanding its wings. This one has expanded its wings and it's expanding its abdomen now. Uh, ovipositors sticking out here. Genital ligula, the copulatory organs sticking out there. Uh, exuvii or cast skins of ones that have emerged previously. They sometimes emerge right on top of one another. Uh, some of the damselflies in areas where they're common, uh, you see this sort of thing. This is a mass emergence in June at Molson Lake uh, in the Okanagan, which is incredibly full of this one species called the Northern Bluette. Millions of them emerge from there over a period of a fairly short time in the spring. It's one of it's a it's a spectacle of nature to get to see this. And, and just when the right conditions are, many of these things will sort of harden up at the same time and they'll lift up into the air and almost in clouds. And all the birds around there, all the blackbirds, all the, all the uh, grebes, all everything that's there is eating these damselflies. So in a way they're like uh, cicadas that emerge in these massive emergences that basically swamp their predators. The predators can't possibly eat all of them. The same thing may be happening with these damselflies. Question. What would a large population like that feed on? I mean, they got other big other form. invertebrates. Okay. Yeah, just smaller thing. Yeah, I didn't say much about the food of the larvae. Uh, they feed on mayflies, caddisflies, smaller dragonflies. They're, they're very cannibalistic. They eat younger stages of their own species. Uh, sometimes, as I say, tadpoles and fish even. But mostly things like mayflies and small crustaceans, daphnia and ostrapods and copepods and things like that. Worms. When they get, when they've uh, fully uh, expanded after they've emerged, they're called a tenoral. They're soft still, they have almost no pigment, they're dull colored, the wings are shiny, dead giveaway for a tenoral of shiny wings, and then they fly away from the water. Well, some of them don't make it. This is a very time of very high mortality. They're not very good flyers, they're not very good at escaping from predators. Uh, they, they, they die by the thousands then. Uh, they for, furnish the main food for red-winged and yellow-headed blackbirds in the Columbia Basin of Washington. Uh, these birds actually breed in large numbers in lakes where there are huge populations of damselflies. And that's why they're there, because they feed their young sometimes almost entirely on emerging damselflies and sometimes dragonflies. What's left behind when a dragonfly emerges is the exuvia. We'll call it cast skin. And these are great because they look, of course, just like the larva. If you can identify a dragonfly from its larva, you can identify it from its exuvia. So people uh, 
spent a lot of time in, around the edges of lakes or ponds or on rivers, uh, actually collecting these things, taking them back to the lab and identifying them. So you can have a tremendous record of what it is that lives in that place without even sampling the larvae, without having to get your feet wet or having to, to go in and disturb the bottom. Uh, this is very much non-destructive sampling because the live dragonfly has already left. Uh, it's a wonderful way to learn about dragonfly populations. Is there any nutritional value to them, or why, why would they eat something like that? Uh, the, not to these at all, no, but to the larvae, yes, lots of nutritional value. Now, is there the blackbirds are eating the, either the larva that climbs up or the adult that's emerging from it, not the exuvia, though. Uh, that's just, that's cuticle, it's pretty much dead, dead tissue. But this is a little collection I made at a lake on Orcas Island. Three uh, blue-eyed darners, a lake darner, and a common green darner. So just in a casual look around this lake, I knew that these three uh, species bred in that lake, no doubt about it. And you can, you can distinguish many of them just at a glance sometimes. After they emerge from the water, they mature. And some dragonflies take a long time to mature. Uh, some small damselflies probably mature in 24 hours. They actually become sexually mature very soon after they emerge from the water. Others take a period of days. Uh, in the tropics, there are odonates that take five to six months to mature. They actually emerge in a rainy season and go through the entire next dry season as immatures. They, they're not fully colored. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, predators. They eat, they sleep, they wander around, but they don't breed. They're not sexually mature. They wait until the next rainy season to become sexually mature. During all that time, uh, they have to warm up. They're, they are uh, ectotherms. They get their heat from the surroundings, just like butterflies and other insects do. And so on a nice and early one morning, a dragonfly will come land on a rock, which reflects the sun back on it and warms it up, and it can uh, become active that way. Thermoregulation, temperature regulation is very important to odonates, just like it is, again, to all insects and amphibians and reptiles and so forth. They have to be warm enough to function. If they're too cool, uh, they can't catch their food, they can't escape predators, they can't mate, they can't do anything. So getting warm is very important to them, and they have a lot of ways to do that, one of which, as I say, is just to sit out in the sun in the morning. This, this was in uh, Edmonton, Alberta. I was there on the way to the Arctic one summer in early June, and we walked into a, an aspen woodland and found these thousands of white-faced dragonflies, oriole white faces, and uh, they were just all over everywhere. And I was photographing, they were sitting on the sunny side of aspen trees, warming up in the early morning. I didn't realize that so many of them were landing on my back, but I'm glad. Uh, my friend who I was with took a picture of it. But then they can get too hot, too, on a nice sunny day in the tropics or even in eastern Washington when the temperature is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, a dragonfly may point its abdomen directly toward the sun at midday to take the least amount of solar radiation. This is called obelisking. It's like an obelisk, like the Washington Monument or something. And some dragonflies don't do that. Instead, they droop the abdomen down the same with the same effect, basically presenting the least amount of their uh, body uh, to the sunlight. So you get perpendicular to the sun in the morning and parallel to the sun rays at midday. And they're very good at orienting to, to accomplish that. Dragonflies have superb vision, probably the best vision of any insects. Each of these compound eyes of this green darner has about 20,000 amatidia and 20,000 simple eyes. Each of those simple eyes picks up images uh, so insects are very good at seeing movement because each of those eyes has its own little optic nerve uh, coming from it and, and stimulating one of those stimulates them. And so something that passes across that, like a prey insect flying over or another dragonfly flying over, is really doing a lot of stimulating a lot of nerves. And so they're very, very good at seeing movement because of this mosaic vision. Again, the antennae. Of an adult. The antennae aren't used for smell in dragonflies, apparently. We're not entirely sure, but we think they're probably more important in, in detecting air currents. Damselflies, with their more widespread eyes, uh, still have quite large eyes as well. Dragonflies are masters of the air. They're probably about as good flyers <coughs> as insect evolution has ever produced. All the wings can be moved independently of one another. They're not yoked at all. And so this is just a single uh, paddle tail darner here hovering, and photos taken of it showing all the different wing positions that they can come up 
with. When they turn, all four wings are moved independently. They can hover, they stop on a dime, they can back up, they can turn over. Uh, they're just amazingly adept at, at flying. Uh, they look like they're going like a bat out of hell when they're probably only going 15 to 20 miles an hour. But for a small animal to go that fast, that's a very, that's very many body lengths per second they're moving. Uh, they all can hover very well. This is a damselfly hovering over a river in Mexico. They can hover for seemingly indefinitely. I've watched them just hang in the air like that for minute after minute after minute until I, I got bored. Uh, this is a, a, a wandering glider. It's the most wide-ranging dragonfly in the world. And it's worldwide species and probably has a, has a record, all the flight records in dragonflies. They've been caught uh, a thousand miles from land on boats and things like that. They migrate across the ocean. This is a species that was uh, written about a couple, uh, about a year and a half ago, I guess. Somebody figured out how they were migrating from the Indian subcontinent through the Seychelles Islands to, the, to East Africa. This was a regular migration route, much of it across the ocean. Uh, if you look at them closely, you see they've got very broad hind wings, and they are gliders. Uh, if you uh, watch videos of this species, they beat about five times, just like an accipiter hawk, and then glide for a while, and beep, 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 and glide for a while, and apparently they can do that, as I say, for a thousand miles across the ocean. They migrate at night. They're the only dragonfly known. They've actually been picked up by radar, swarms of them, off the uh, Japanese coast. If you look closely at a dragonfly wing, they're, they're made up of all these little cells, which are really nice and very pretty, and they, we actually use them to classify dragonflies as part of the, the course of all these veins. But if you look closely, the wings are amazing marvels of engineering. They're pleated, for one thing, like an accordion. They go up and down, up and down, up and down, which gives them a lot of strength and rigidity. They've got all these little uh, CT or, or pointed structures on them, thorns, if you want to call them, which we don't know the function of. <coughs> what was the name of that species again? Uh, wandering glider, Pantala flabescens. They're all predators, as I said, not a vegetarian among them. This is a damselfly chewing up a little uh, leaf hopper. Uh, most of them eat small prey, small flies, so soft body things, small flies, leaf hoppers, small beetles, things like that, but probably just about anything. Again, look how hairy some of the species are. Uh, they use their legs to capture their prey, so the legs are very spiny on dragonflies. Uh, this is probably the last sight many a small insect has seen. <laughs> this is a dragonfly, big eyes coming at it. Here's the mandibles. The mandibles are mostly covered by the, the uh, labrum, this uh, anterior most part of the head here, but they can be extended out from that very, very hard, very sharp, and they can chew up prey pretty rapidly. Including, sorry to say, butterflies. Uh, there are some kinds of dragonflies that are actually specialist butterfly eaters. This is a common green darner. This is our state insect. And it's eating, anybody know what that is? No. It's in South Texas. Uh, you, said, you, used, you said Washington State, and so I thought oh, it was like here. Uh, uh, like queen, it's, it's, it. <laughs> it's a queen, yeah. But it's interesting because, of course, birds don't eat these because they're poisonous. And dragon insects apparently have no problem at all eating poisonous butterflies. Uh, some dragonflies, I've seen several dragonflies with various quite distasteful butterflies. Well, you notice it's, we're not working on the wings where the poison is, it's working on the Well, I could, yeah, that yeah. could be. It certainly, and they don't normally eat the wings, they drop the wings, so that's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, they eat each other. This is a, an eastern pond hawk, which is one of the more predatory dragonflies in North America. It seems to eat a tremendous amount of smaller dragonflies, as well as butterflies, as well as other things. Uh, damselflies can eat other damselflies. Uh, I've seen damselflies eating damselflies larger than they are, even. But of course, they're also prey. Here's the same uh, common green darner species being taken by a Kiskiti in South Texas. A uh, uh, saddlebags dragonfly by a tricolored heron. Herons are amazing dragonfly catchers. They just sit still and a dragonfly will approach them to perch on their bill and just snap it out of the air. <laughs> People have actually watched green, green uh, bitters with their, you know, they hold their beak straight up and dragonflies literally coming into land as they would on a stick or something. <laughs> Apparently all the members of 
that your own family are perfectly happy catching a dragonfly in flight. Lizards catch them. I was photographing this uh, common whitetail on a rock in Oregon. Actually, I went click, 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 and all of a sudden there was a lizard in the picture, and this fence lizard had just dashed out, grabbed this thing on a rock. I, I watched it sort of chew it up and swallow it. Uh, spiders catch a tremendous amount of them, especially when they're young, when they just emerged from the water. There are many areas where spiders build a bank of webs along the shore of a lake or pond or river, and seemingly almost just to catch all the dragonflies that are emerging and flying away from the water. Question? Um, will the dragonflies sometimes eat the spiders? Say again? Will the dragonflies sometimes eat the spiders? Yes, they do. Uh, not too many of them, but there are some tropical damselflies that specialize in spiders. They actually go around through the forest looking for spider webs and plucking the spiders out of them. Mm -hmm. Most dragonflies eat, most dragonflies tend to eat moving prey. I didn't say anything about foraging in dragonflies. Uh, I probably should have, uh, but damselflies often catch stationary prey and they're the ones that get spiders. Uh, robber flies eat them. Robber flies are interesting. No dragonfly has ever been reported eating a robber fly. So my guess is that robber flies have such a potent bite and they're so quick at using it that a dragonfly that caught one might well get bitten. So there's been very strong selection against going after robber flies. Robber flies, on the other hand, eat a lot of dragonflies. They can actually catch a dragonfly three times their size and just bring it down immediately. Praying mantises catch them. Uh, lots of vertebrates other than, other than birds catch them. I was uh, studying dragonflies out at the potholes, actually. Uh, that dragonfly's on a fishing line. We would catch them, tie, put, tie a little loop around their thorax, and fly them to other dragonflies to see how they would respond, looking to see whether we could presenting a female dragonfly to males of several species to see if they recognize their own species and that sort of thing, presenting males to other males to see their territorial interactions. And if there were leopard frogs around and we got the dragonfly a little bit too low, it's gone. <laughs> That's when leopard frogs are still common in Eastern Washington. Fish are major predators on dragonflies. They fly too low over the water. I've watched dragonflies going over the water and bass actually following them underwater trying to wait until the dragon, I mean, waiting for the dragonfly to slow down or stop, and they just come right out of the water and grab them. And parasites, they have lots of parasites. They have water mites, both of this dragonfly, this meadowhawk, and this spreadwing damselfly have emerged from the water. The water mites get on the larva, and they just sit on the larva, basically. The dragonfly goes up and emerges, and as it comes out of the exuvia, the cast skin, the mites all climb right onto the adult. And so that's why they tend to be more on the thorax, which comes out first, and more on the tip of the abdomen, which comes out last. Uh, that's where they very often are concentrated. These have an especially heavy mite load. Uh, many individuals that you see just have a couple of them on them. So the dragonfly carries the mites around, but the mites actually feed from the dragonfly. They pierce the cuticle of the dragonfly and are sucking body fluids. If there are a few of them, they seem to have no effect at all. Sometimes when there are very large numbers of them, they do have an effect. But in any case, the dragonflies go away from the water with the mites on them, come back to the water when they're sexually mature, and the mites just all fall off. So the dragonflies are actually, uh, the mites are using the dragonflies as their transport from place to place, their dispersal mechanism. Other question? Can they get rid of the mites before they eat or Do they? Can they get rid of the mites before they eat? Uh, mostly, yeah, not entirely. This is, this is, both of these are quite mature, so they're both in a state of mating. Uh, I, I photographed one damselfly. The way they mate, if they have too many mites on them, they can't mate, so they actually mess them up that way, too. And then in the, in the tropics, you find the little blood-sucking uh, sandflies, ceratopagonid flies, just like no CMs and sandflies actually get on the basal wing veins of dragonflies that have blood on it in them. The rest of the wing is, is dead tissue, but the basal veins still have some blood, and these little tiny, tiny flies get on there and suck that blood. It's very common to see that in the tropics. This particular one had eight, uh, eight flies on it. Then they mature. This one, this is a young individual, this uh, liar chip spread wing, and this is what it looks like when it's mature. It changes color. Uh, it gets a lot, of, a lot of times blue is the color of, of mature odinates. Uh, pruinosity occurs on them. This is a, a, a whitish powdery bloom that's developed that actually goes through the cuticle and changes the color of the dragonfly. 
Uh, it's pretty easy to tell the sexes of dragonflies. They're differently shaped. The males are usually more slender than the females. The female has a, a bigger abdomen for holding all the eggs that they lay, uh, which can total thousands in some dragonflies. Uh, the male has a secondary genitalia under the second abdominal segment, which usually shows up. And you'll see what, how that's used in a minute. Uh, they have a different setup at the end of the abdomen. The male has three appendages here. The female has only two. In this case, you can actually see the structure that holds the eggs before they lay them. So structurally, uh, it's pretty easy to tell the sexes of odonates apart. Sometimes they're very differently colored. They have a lot of sexual dimorphism. Sometimes the male and female are colored very similarly. Uh, many, many species are territorial. In that way, they're very much like birds. The males actually defend the territory. A male dragonfly might have a territory almost as big as this room. It was a large species. And any other male that came into that territory would chase it away. And just like in birds, usually the owner of the territory sort of tends to win the battles. And the reason for this is, is purely for access to females. Uh, a robin defends a territory to not only have a mate, but to raise its young and have enough food around it so that it can do that successfully. Dragonflies usually don't defend territories for food. The males defend them so that if a female comes there, it will be the only male there, and it will be able to mate with her. Question. Will they defend against males that are not conspecific? Uh, Do they drive if they everybody look, off, or can they tell? If they look similar the enough, they make a mistake. If they look very different, they don't. They don't. Yeah. Okay. So they often chase similar-looking dragonflies, even if they're not the same species. Okay. So they're not. They're not perfect by any means. Uh, here's three male common white tails, actually, all of which had territories in this area. One of them mated with this female, which is laying eggs and they're chasing each other around constantly to try to get rid of the other males so they'd have, again, sole access to the female. So the female, the larvae live in the water. Females come to the water to lay eggs. They go to some optimal place where the, presumably they are programmed to know where to lay their eggs because that's a good habitat for their larvae. The males come to the water because that's where the females are going to be. Females come to the water only for mating and egg laying. The males basically have to stay there all the time if they want to mate. And so what you see when you go to a pond is basically lots and lots of male odonates. You may not see any females at all unless one pair has to, happens to be mating or you know, something's going on like that. Uh, many dragonflies are not territorial, but basically just cruise around all the time. This is a, 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 a darner, a, I guess a lake darner, uh, just cruising around looking for females. Again, the only reason it's at the water is to look for females to mate. Me. The mating imperative is very strong in dragonflies. Uh, damselflies are mostly not territorial. Some, some species are, but most of the ones we see here are not. They basically just come to the water, males looking for females. Uh, in this case, there's mostly males, but see there's a few of these that are actually already paired up. And they can be incredibly abundant in very, very high densities in places. These are bluettes. Question. How clean does the water have to be for them to use it for breeding? Uh, clean in the sense of not muddy. Uh, for some species, yeah. For some species, they couldn't care less. They thrive in horrible looking muddy places. But that's just normal, normal mud. Polluted is another story. Uh, pollution affects a lot of the species. So again, if you talk about clear versus muddy water, a lot of them can live in muddy water. But uh, pollution, no. Question. Mating strategy for the damselflies, do, do the males gather and sort of just hang around and then the females uh, yeah, visit come that in, pile of males? Come in and get grabbed. Basically a female coming across the water here would just be assaulted by males. So they come out because they want to get laid and or that's basically it. So <laughs> yeah. no, the eggs are what want to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> So this is what happens, a male grabs a female, uh, in this case uh, by the prothorax and the thorax here, and his appendages at the end of his abdomen fit very nicely in there, and if he, they don't fit, he has to, he won't drop her. If they fit, but she, you don't feel right to her, she will not mate. So it's a sort of a lock and key, it's both a tactile and a, an actual mechanical uh, situation where the male has to be able to grab the female, so these two parts have to be able to fit together, and it has to feel right to the female, or she will not mate. And in the case of mating, he grabs her, but they're not yet mating. Mating, oh, oh, now his next step is to actually fill his genitalia on the second abdominal segment of sperm. 
he waits apparently to have the freshest sperm possible, so he does it after he's actually grabbed the female. So that's what this male is doing now. You see that structure here, the actual penis or genital ligula is actually protruding a little bit more than you would usually see. And as soon as he then does this, he's, he's uh, uh, filling it with sperm. And then the next thing, he releases that, and the next thing the female swings her abdomen up and contacts him in that spot. So this is the so-called wheel position, or I like to call it the heart position. And now they are copulating, and now sperm is being transferred. The neat thing about odinates is that this was actually first discovered in damselflies, that when the male inserts his copulatory organ in the female's seminal receptacle or vagina, uh, he actually scoops out any sperm that's already in there and gets rid of it and substitutes his own for it. This is called sperm displacement, and it seems to be almost universal in odinates. <coughs> when they mate, they, the male has some adaptation, some fancy hook or, or, or projection on his penis, and he can actually scoop out the sperm that's there and get rid of it and deposit his own. And that was first found in damselfly, and now it's been found to be the case in many, many kinds of animals. The same sort of thing happens. You mentioned a lock and key thing. That was for species, to recognize species? Yes. Yes, for uh, uh, reproductive isolation. This dragonfly, this is something you very rarely see. This dragonfly is filling, is doing the same thing. It's filling its copulatory organ with sperm. Dragonflies do it before they mate. Damselflies do it after they've actually hooked up with the female. But this is what you would see. I've only seen this a couple times in my life. Now these are copulating, the same as, as you saw with the uh, damselfly, the male grabs the female, but grabs her by the head instead of the prothorax and hooks onto the head and then she will, and he's already filled his, his uh, copulatory organ with sperm and then she will swing her abdomen around and, and connect with him there. And see they're facing the same, this is a unique thing, you know how butterflies mate tail to tail. And that's not very efficient in escaping from predators, is it? Which way do we fly, you know, who leads the who leads the way, must be awkward if one of them flying backward. Dragonflies live out in the open. Much of their life is really out in the open. They're over the water. They're very vulnerable to predation by birds especially. And so being able to escape predation has been a very strong selective pressure, which has led to this still not entirely understood how this evolved, but this very special wheel mating position where in fact as they fly they're both facing the same way. And I've tried to catch many, many mating pairs in my life, and they are just about as hard to catch as single individuals. They're very, very adept at flying. They're both facing exactly the same way when they fly. <clears throat> a little bit better idea how they're hooked up. These are green darners here. The inferior appendage of the male is on top of the female's head, and it's actually got little teeth in the corner. So they're actually pressing into the eyes of the female. And you can actually catch a female darner and look at her eyes and see if she's mated. You can actually see two little dimples in that spot where the male has been holding on to her, which is really a neat thing to be able to see. And then the much longer superior appendages, or cerci, uh, are holding onto the back of her head there. They stay together like this. Sometimes they, these are damselflies that stay in what we call in tandem, and they move around the environment looking for places to lay eggs. And the reason the male stays hooked onto the female is because then no other male can mate with her. And so it's to his advantage to just stay hooked up, and that's what they do, many of the damselflies, for long periods of time. They fly very well like that, they hover very well like that, and then they finally come and, and lay their eggs like that. Again, the female's laying the egg, she's already been fertilized, Males just holding on to her, keeping other males from mating with her. You said long periods of time. What do you mean? How hours. Long? Hours. Yeah, not days, but hours. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sometimes there are especially good oviposition substrates, like this floating plate of uh, algae in this river. And so all the damselflies in the area are attracted to it. They're actually attracted to one another because if a couple of damselflies are already uh, Laying their eggs here, that means there's no predators there. Nothing has eaten them yet, so that's a safe place to come and lay your eggs, and they do. In a river where the current is moving a lot of things around, it probably doesn't matter if hundreds of eggs are laid in the same place here, because when the larvae hatch out of them, they'll probably drift down river and so forth anyway. So it's not as if they have this intense competition of larvae just because they're all laying their eggs in the same place. Three different species of damselflies here on a river in Ohio. 
Uh, plenty of them also oviposit by themselves. These can actually split up, and sometimes they do, and the female just goes on and, and lays the eggs by herself. Uh, other times in this species, uh, a kind of fork tail, uh, they never do it in tandem. The, the female uh, separates from the male and just lays eggs on her own. Uh, here's a darner laying eggs. You can get a little bit better idea how they do that. They've actually got an ovipositor uh, that the eggs run down a channel in this, and this pierces the stem. And there's probably some marks here that actually show where other eggs have been laid in the stem already. And each and single eggs are deposited in there. Then the female moves a few millimeters and lays another egg and moves again and lays another egg. So they're laying it inside the leaf? Then? Inside the plant tissue, yeah. These are called endophytic ovipositors. All damselflies, all darners, and several other families have a very well-developed ovipositor and they lay their eggs in the plant tissue. Or sometimes in rotten logs, uh, sometimes in mud. Uh, many of the other dragonflies, including all the skimmer family and some others as well as clubtail, uh, don't do that. They, they're exophytic ovipositors. They lay their eggs outside plants just in the water. This female is building up an egg ball. She's got a special uh, anatomy at the end of the abdomen for holding onto those eggs as they come out. And they come out sort of little by little, but they collect in this ball. And when enough of them comes, she then flies to the water, taps her abdomen in the water, and drops the eggs. Here's a female uh, blue dasher hovering over a pond. She's ready to lay her eggs, and she just dips into the water there under the duckweed and drops a few eggs. Sometimes they lay a single egg, or usually it's a clump, a bunch of eggs. And then they'll move on and lay another bunch. They can do that singly, probably the case for most dragonflies, or in tandem. Some dragonflies stay in tandem, like all of the meadowhawks we have here in Washington, and fly around the same way. The male is protecting the female. She's not going to get baited by anybody else. And they'll hover over one spot. And the male, in this case, actually is deciding where they lay their eggs. We know enough to know that it's the male that's basically pulling the female along. And so he has to be programmed to know good spots for laying eggs, too, and all these species that do it in tandem. And then they'll drop to the water, drop a bunch of eggs, and then move on to it again. Then they come to the end of their life. They, the adults uh, around, around here, the little damselflies live maybe a week or five days. Uh, the bigger the skimmers live maybe two weeks to a month. And the big darners may live a month or five weeks or so, but that's about it. Uh, some dragonflies in the tropics, as I said, go from one rainy season to another. The longest known marked dragonfly ever was six months. And that was a big damselfly of Barrow, Colorado Island, and Panama. The marked individual <coughs> was recaptured or recovered six months later. Most of them were much shorter times than that. So the water striders come and feed on them and the beetles, or if they die on land, the ants get them and so forth. But they leave behind their eggs in the next generation and start. This is a darner egg laid in a plant that was teased out and hatched in captivity into this tiny little larva. But dragonflies vary, so that's sort of the life history of a dragonfly. Dragonflies vary in size. This, I caught these two at the same lake in Australia. One of the largest dragonflies in the world, one of the smallest. Gives you some idea of size range there. Uh, damselflies can be larger than dragonflies. This is a, a Costa Rican scene here with a rather small dragonfly and rather large damselfly just perching in the same place. But again, mostly it's the dragonflies that are bigger. Uh, dragonflies vary tremendously in shape. This is a broad-bodied chaser uh, from Europe, a common dragonfly in Europe, one of the broadest bodies of the skimmer family. Uh, this is in the same family, a dragonfly from Southeast Asia that uh, feeds at dusk and roosts in the rainforest in the daytime. Probably looks like a vine hanging down, very, very hard to see by any potential predator. Yet they both still can fly just fine. <laughs> Probably the weight of the abdomen behind the wings is not too dissimilar between this one and this one. So they're balanced for their aerodynamically. You say the weight of that abdomen is... Say again? You say the weight of those abdomens are similar? Uh, possibly, yeah. This is, the, this is much, much, much longer. That, yeah, this, this one may, may be heavier. I suppose it probably is. And so they probably fly somewhere. If this one flies all the time in the daytime, this one comes out and flies only for a short time at dusk. So that probably makes some difference in, in their life, uh, in the way they're like. Look at the huge eyes on the dusk flying one. 
you get a little more leverage with that long abdomen right. too. Yeah, right. that's true too. Right. Then right close to, not that one, the fatter one. Oh, yeah. yeah. But then right close to the abdomen, there's coloration. Yeah, lots of dragonflies have pigmented wings or partially pigmented wings. That's probably for species recognition. We don't really know of any other function of, you know, of the pigment in the wings. Uh, colors on dragonflies are all colors of the rainbow. This is one genus of dragonflies that are, or damselflies that are common in the southern United States and uh, all through the American tropics, just different species showing some variation in color. Uh, some damselflies are spectacularly colored. This is a, a dancing jewel from southern Africa. Uh, also a damselfly, even though it's got a relatively short abdomen. Uh, many odonates have colored wings, all sorts of colors. This is a South American species. They actually land and they wave their wings to show off that beautiful iridescent color in the red bases. They move them in different directions, seem to be displaying uh, territoriality by doing that. Uh, some of them are just unbelievable. This is a very small South American dragonfly that's, uh, uh, I call them mini morphos. They're blue, they're very much like the blue of a morpho butterfly. And yet, many, many dragonflies are not brightly colored, they're cryptic. This is a species that roosts on uh, pine tree trunks in the southeastern U.S., a great metal tail and they're really hard to see. You usually flush them off the tree before you see them. So dragonflies are a small, a relatively small order with only 5,600 known species. We estimate there may be as many as a thousand more still undescribed. We're discovering new species of dragonflies uh, constantly in the tropics. I would say there's a new one described from the United States about every three or four years. We're still discovering new species in the United States so with very small restricted ranges, uh, 462 in North America, north of Mexico, 80 species in Washington, as I tell people, I'm um, sort of like Bob Pyle, who moved into the worst place for butterflies in, in the world, perhaps, to live. Um, Washington has the smallest butterfly list of any of the lower 48 states, uh, sorry, the smallest dragonfly uh, list. Uh, Rhode Island has uh, 130 species, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The east, the north, the east, and even the northeast much, much better for dragonflies than the West. In Washington, does it have an Eastern Washington, Western Washington for butterflies? Western Washington has few uh, in Western Washington, but Eastern Washington yeah. has many. Is that true for the open as well? It's less discrepant than in the oh. butterflies, because you never see what the highest county list is. Oh. And that's, oh. actually, that's actually the <laughs> highest county list in county. And it's almost surely because it's a county I've lived in for 43 years. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's very rich in our own county here. There's 10 families of Odinates in Washington, three damselfly families, and seven dragonfly families. The only really big families are the pond damselflies of many species, uh, the darners, uh, and the skimmers, those are the biggest families in Washington, but we'll look at a few of those. Now, this is all, this, most of this is all new stuff. I didn't have this before. Uh, several of your members asked me to put more stuff on sort of specifics about dragonflies rather than just my general lecture. So I'm just adding some, some more specifics. They're just dragonfly habitats, lakes, ponds, uh, seasonal wetlands. Many species, or some species actually live in wetlands that dry up every year. Their life history is such that they lay eggs in the summer over completely dry land and the water basin then fills up with water when the winter rains come and the, the eggs are in there uh, dormant basically through the winter but as the water temperature <coughs> warms in the spring the eggs finally hatch. As it warms even more the larvae develop into the summer and they emerge from the water sometime in midsummer before the pond is dried up and then it dries up and the cycle starts again. So those obviously just have a one year life cycle. Does it be both endophytic and exophytic? Yes, both dragonflies and damselflies, the skimmers and, and damselflies, yeah. Yeah, because there's some uh, dragonflies that actually you can see them laying their eggs, just dropping them onto the grass one after another. Uh, streams and rivers have their own species, some of the rarer species uh, in Washington live in, in river type habitats. And then mountain lakes and bogs have another set. So you really, it's like, uh, like butterflies, you basically, 
have to go to different places to find different kinds. Both spatially, you have to go to different habitats, and one lake may not be the same as another lake, just like one meadow may not be the same as another meadow for butterflies. One stream may not be the same as another stream. Even if they look exactly the same, they still may have different dragonflies just because there's something in there. This one attracts species A and this one attracts species B, so you really have to look around a lot. And then there's the seasonality, again, the same as in butterfly. Some species fly in the spring, the majority in midsummer, some in the fall only. So let's look at these families really quickly. Uh, the Calopterygidae, the jewel wings. Uh, these are large, the lar our largest damsel flies. They're very beautiful. There's only one genus and one species in Washington. Their wings are broad and very densely veined. Uh, many antinoa crossways, I could have left that out. But the notice is sort of the middle part of the wing here. And in most damsel flies, there's only two cross veins in the front here, uh, closer to the body. In these, there are many, many. Uh, they're very metallic and iridescent. Anyway, this is an unmistakable uh, dragonfly or damselfly, the river jewel wing. Uh, it's common in the Black River down south of Olympia. That's, that's probably the greatest populations of it in Washington, but it's scattered out in other parts of the state as well, mostly in the southern part. It's on Stossel Creek uh, in, in King County. Uh, that's actually the northernmost population of them in western Washington. One population we've found before in Stevens County and haven't been able to find it since. Uh, the females look like the males but have a big white stigma here. Lestidae, the spread wings, uh, these are unmistakable when they have their wings open. They're also big damselflies and they perch with their wings open. They put a lie to the statement that all damselflies perch with the wings closed. The stigma, which is this structure, which is an inertial regulator of pitch, by the way, it's very important in the wings. It actually sort of stabilizes the wings as they move through the air, having this little weight sort of near the end of them. Uh, they have long leg spines for catching prey, uh, metallic abdomen, blue eyes in all the mature males, and they're among the damselflies that are often in seasonal wetlands. And just a couple of species of them. The spotted spread wing is probably the most common species of the, of the uh, family. And you can see these are county records. I just made up all these maps today. <clears throat> I hadn't really done that before. And there are several places on, published with uh, dragonfly range maps uh, on, uh, on the web, too, with, for the whole of North America. Um, again, wings spread out. This is a, one of our most abundant damselflies in the fall. It's the last damselfly to fly in the fall, right into November. And it's very common at, even at large lakes, whereas most of the spread wings are at small ponds and lakes. And it's got just a few spots underneath the thorax, for what give it its name, spotted spread wing. Uh, Utenates did not have common names uh, back when I started in the group, really in, back until about 10 years ago. And uh, a colleague of mine, Sidney Dunkel, and I actually made up the common names for all North American dragonflies. And we submitted them to the Dragonfly Society of the Americas and members got to sort of look at them and make comments and a couple of changes were suggested which we accepted and then that list then became the official list of, of common names of North American dragonflies. So nothing like the controversy that's been in the butterfly field about common names. I think. <laughs> and another spread wing, the emerald spread wing, we're a pretty one with beautiful emerald green uh, thorax and somewhat the abdomen as well. A little bit more restricted in range, tends to be more common in the mountains. And then the major damselfly family is Cenagrionidae, the pond damsel. This is pretty much all the typical damselflies you see with their wings closed, they're small, stigma is shorter than in these spread wings. And I should say the spread wings sometimes close their wings for various reasons, so it uh, doesn't mean it's not a spread wing just because it's got its wings closed. But these are all smaller than the spread wing. Very many species are blue. Uh, they live pretty much everywhere. There's 14 species up in the state. And there are a couple species. Blue damselflies that are all over Washington, all over North America. The Thule blue red is probably this, the most ubiquitous one. This is <coughs> one of only three species that I found in all 39 of Washington counties. Uh, I'm sure there are more species that occur in all of them. We just haven't done as, as much survey work. For all that we've done over the years, it's still not enough to uh, 
pin down all the records. <coughs> but anyway, this is a very common sort of alternating blue and black damsel fly. And the, the abdomen has more black than blue. The blue parts of it are narrower than the black parts. That's important to see for a truly blue abdomen. Uh, the appendages at the end, there's two above and two below. The cerci are the two above. The paraprops are the two below. And in the Thule bluette, the circus is longer than the paraproc, has a little tubercle at the end. Uh, in contrast with uh, these other two equally abundant species that occur all across the state as well, the northern and the boreal bluette, the only two ruminates that I can't tell apart in the field. They're absolutely identical except for the appendages. The northern bluette has a pointed uh, circus or superior appendage, the boreal is rounded. And in both cases, the inferior part, the paraprop, is longer than the upper part, the circus, contrary to the blue, to the Thule bluet. In these cases, there's more blue than black on the abdomen of the males. So these are the very widespread blue bluets as well. The females are polymorphic in many damsel flies. They can be brown or blue. It's a brown female, it's a blue female. That in itself is a very interesting uh, topic for study. And here's comparing the Thule and a northern bluette. Again, the Thule are more black on the abdomen than the northern and the boreal bluettes. But again, absolutely cannot tell these apart in the field. You have to catch them and look very closely to tell them apart. So when I've surveyed these, I go out with a net and I catch 10 males and look at each one with a hand lens. And then I record you know, 10 boreals or 10 northerns or 7 boreals or 3 northerns or something. That's how I've learned. Where they, where they live all across Washington. Very commonly live together in the same lakes. Nobody knows how they differ ecologically. Maybe they don't. Fork tails are another major group of damselflies in this family. And they're black. They have a black abdomen with a blue tip, unlike the bluettes. So it's easy to tell a fork tail male from a bluette male. And, uh, male Pacific fork tail is our most ubiquitous damselfly. It's probably in the most habitats. It's the one that will come into to ponds that you dig in your yard uh, out in the suburbs. And it's got four little blue dots on top of a black thorax. Nothing else in the state has that. Females start out very pretty pink and orange, change to very dull as they mature. They're probably like this only for a day or two. And then there are two forms of females, polymorphic, as I said about the bluettes. One is this one. The other is this one. Looks more like a male, actually. Uh, the other very common fork tail is, is the western fork tail, which has a striped thorax instead of, a, <coughs> instead of a spotted thorax. And this is a fairly blue thorax. This is quite green. This also changes with age, which some dragonflies do, making them harder to identify. Yet a butterfly, I guess, comes out of its pupa, and it looks the same for the rest of its life. They may vary ge uh, seasonally and geographically, but at least they don't change with age like dragonflies do. And this starts out orange and black for a very brief time and then becomes this pruinos gray thing. And finally, just to complete the fork tails, one group, this is a northwest endemic. Its entire geographic range is the northwest coast here, like big leaf maples and many other species we know here in Aplodontias and giant salamanders, and just a little bit into British Columbia. And this is a beautiful thing. It's got a lot of blue on the abdomen. Big, great big fork tail, flies in the spring, it's very common in May and June, and then pretty much gone. So it's a, it's a thing that people would come to the Northwest to see. <coughs> Bluettes versus fork tails, sometimes they perch together. Here's a western fork tail with a, with a bluette. Here's a Pacific fork tail, also perched on a leaf with a bluette. So pretty easy to tell those two groups of well. Petaluridae, the petal tails, only one species. How am I doing with time? Anybody? Are we supposed to be finished by nine? No, we always One. stop over. <laughs> Ten minutes? Yeah, keep okay. Going. Okay. Keep going. Uh, the petal tails, this is a really special northwest species. Again, it's a northwest endemic from southern British Columbia to northern California. All, pretty much all in the mountains up here, not in the lowlands. Uh, the eye, it's got brown eyes, which are separated. Uh, the female has an ovipositor, like a darner. Uh, there's only two petal tails in North America. They're the most primitive dragonflies, and they have a relic distribution. They're scattered all over the world. We have one in the Northwest. The larvae are semi-terrestrial. They actually live in burrows in boggy areas, and they actually 
come out at night and feed on beetles and spiders walking across the ground to catch them, the only terrestrial larvae in, in uh, the Northwest. Other question? So anyway, that's better photographs of them. This is their range, but this overestimates that they're basically just way up in the Cascades, way up in the Olympics, and that's it. So all these counties, the records are, are well up in the mountains, say above 3,000 feet. They're at Snoqualmie Pass, they're uh, scattered around, they're in bogs and seeps, or sometimes little streams. Uh, uh, not too many localities that I know that I can just go to and find one easily. But this is on a pitcher plant in southwestern Oregon where they're very common. <coughs> the darners are one of our prominent families. They're these big blue depth dragonflies you see flying around in the fall. Large with long abdomens, large eyes. Uh, females have ovipositors. Uh, the males, most of them have a lot of blue. They're flyers. The dragonflies divide into two groups. Flyers, which fly around to catch their prey. They're basically behaving like swallows, and that includes this darner family. And they're flying around looking for mates, so they're basically in the air all the time. When they land, they don't perch. They hang up under a branch. So and when they hang up, they're pretty much, I mean, they can see you coming and they'll fly away, but they're not doing anything. They're not looking for mates. They're not looking for food. They're basically just resting. When they want to go out and look for food, look for mates, they start flying around again. The other kind are perchers. They're the ones that you see perching horizontally on branches and on the ground. They're actually looking around for things. They're living their active life while they're perching. So it's this really strong dichotomy. All dragonflies are either flyers or perchers. So they're hunting while perching? They're looking for food? The dragonflies that are perched, that are perchers, are, behave like fly catchers in the yes. bird world. They're actually, if you watch them, you see their eyes turn their head, turning around, looking all over. They see something, zip, out, catch it. There are two genera of these <coughs> darners here. Again, you know, that's a lot of detail. But one of the things you look at are the appendages of the males. Simple appendages, big paddle-shaped thing, or fork in the case of one species. And there's there's 11 of these in Washington, so it's one of our identification problems. One of the groups that you you think, oh, they're all the same, these big blue things. In fact, there's 11 different kinds. And I'm just putting a couple of them in here. The variable darner is a very common one with simple appendages. It's got the narrowest thoracic stripes of any of them. In fact, even broken up into spots in some populations. And there's a lot of uh, maps that I have that look something like this. Uh, it just means it hasn't been found in these counties, probably. Uh, but it probably is, it may be absent from these counties because it's more of a thing that lives in wooded areas or maybe higher up in the mountains in some cases. All those certainly known from Grant and Lincoln County, so those are uh, not very wooded and fairly low. But anyway, I've never found it in this bunch of counties. So there's still a lot to be done in Washington. If somebody wants to go live in uh, Franklin County there out in the middle of the wheat fields, you probably find some new county records of dragonflies. Paddle tail darner is probably our most common darner in the fall. It's the one that's around from July right on into early November. And basically you see them everywhere flying around, feeding, uh, flying along the edges of lakes and ponds. Uh, it's one of the ones with the paddle shaped appendages, although there's three species in Washington with that shape. Pretty much everywhere, I'm sure it occurs in all these counties. I just haven't found them in Wakai. I haven't found them there. And it's look alike the shadow darner, which is basically flies at the same time, the same habitats. Uh, you see them both flying together on the ponds in Magnuson Park, which, by the way, is the best locality for dragonflies in the Seattle area, uh, at least west of Lake Washington. Uh, and they're very similar, except this just one has smaller blue spots, so it looks much darker when it flies by. And there's a difference. The paddle tail has more blue. It's got the last uh, segment of the abdomen with a blue spot, and the shadow darner that's black. The paddle tail has brown under the abdomen. The shadow darner has blue spots under the abdomen. So in the hand, they're very easy to tell. If you see them fairly well, you can sometimes see this, and this one just has less blue generally when they fly by, but they're <coughs> in very, very many areas. So do you just net them to catch them? Yeah, the best way probably to learn to identify dragonflies is to net them, have them in the hand, 
figure out what they are, let them go if you want, or take them as a specimen if you want, and then you'll know better next time. If you only see them flying by, they're not so easy to identify, depending on, on the group and so forth, but especially these big blue dogs. But sometimes you see them hanging up too. And as I tell people, one good way to learn dragonflies is to photograph them. Just basically take a lot of pictures of them and then take your photographs back and look in the guidebooks to see if you can identify them from the photo. And you can in many cases. Uh, this is our common early spring dragonfly. This is the, so this is the one, if you see a blue uh, dragonfly flying around sort of at the end of April, it's California darner, and huzzah, the dragonfly season has started again. Much short, much later than butterfly season, uh, we just get nothing until about the last week or so of April, and then just a couple of species appear. It's a uh, genus name change there. That used to be Eshna, and now it's it's Ryan Eshna. It's a it's a tropical group basically that uh, that's quite different from the northern Eshnas, and has several structural differences. They, they behave the same. They look the same. This is the smallest of our gardeners. So. And then the other extremely common darner here, easily identified by its bright sky blue eyes or the blue-eyed darner. Uh, this was a darner that was called domestic by one of the early students of dragonflies that lived in Washington. Uh, actually, the only student of dragonflies that ever lived here besides me. Uh, and he was, in, he was here 100 years ago. And he, uh, this was a dragonfly that flew all around the farms and pretty much all the towns. And now it's the dragonfly. If you are walking down the street in Seattle and you see one of these blue darners cruising by you on a city street, it's probably a blue eyed darner because they're just everywhere. And they have the fork shaped appendages and they have bright sky blue eyes. What are the green counties on the map? Uh, site records only. Yeah, this is a map that we had posted. That is the maps that Dave Nunnally actually made up. Mm -hmm. Uh, when back in the days when he was interested in dragonflies. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and were uh, posted online for a long, long time. But now there's a website called Odinata Central, which actually has all the dragonfly ranges plotted, and they're being added to constantly. So I pretty much gave up these maps, and now people look at this Odinata Central website. But these were, this was all there was, and they were, we just had them for the Western United States. This was all there was for a number of years. <coughs> dragonfly ranges online, and we were adding to it constantly. Uh, and I just, I didn't get around to replacing these maps with the new ones that I was working on today. Uh, the common green darner is the, is our state insect. I should have written that there. It's unique in having a bright green thorax. A mature male has a blue abdomen. Mature female has a brown abdomen. The young individuals have brown eyes. And it's a migrant. It actually, the adults come up here uh, usually in May and uh, up here from the south. We don't know where they're coming from, but there's a big program started called the Migratory Dragonfly Partnership. I should have written something about that. Uh, that's just starting now. I'm heavily involved in that. We're actually trying to study dragonfly migration in North America. We're turning it into a citizen science project, just as it's been done with monarchs and birds. So stay tuned. There'll be a lot more publicity for that coming along. And this is one of the focal species. And this is, only, this is the only large dragonfly that overposits in tandem. You see pairs of these great big dragonflies flying around like this. Very, very beautiful. It's not as common as all those blue darners, but locally common. Magnuson Park is a great place to see a lot of them. Club tails, uh, these are among the rarer dragonflies of Washington. They live in streams and rivers. They have small eyes that are separated. They very often have a, a club tip to the abdomen. They're very brightly patterned like this one. This is a special dragonfly to me because, it, <coughs> uh, because it's one I described. So <laughs> it's the only uh, new species discovered in Washington for about the last 100 years. Who described it? Uh, I did. Um, <laughs> it's more common in Oregon. It's on a couple of rivers in Oregon, the John Day and the Mallory River, and otherwise it's only known from the Yakima River in Washington. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the Yakima Horn, uh, on the Yakima River, that is there in July, and there's several other rare club-tailed dragonflies there in August. It's a really good place to see them and photograph them, catch them if you want. So this is one of the rarest dragonflies in North America, because it's known only from three small, <coughs> small river systems. <coughs> and there's an, 
another species of club tail. This is a western Washington species, quite common on Rock Creek down in Lickitat County, common on a few streams elsewhere here, uh, common on Stossel Creek in King County along with those river jewel wings. Uh, Dave Donnelly, again, explorer that he is, discovered Langendorfer Lake at Stossel Creek, a complex of wetlands uh, out east of Carnation that are really fabulous for open eights. Both the stream and the, and the small lake itself are among the best locations for dragonflies in Washington. Uh, a single species of spike tail, a very beautiful dragonfly uh, that lives mostly in the parts of the Cascades. <coughs> Uh, the males are, are sort of a combination of flyers and perchers. They feed in flight, but then they come in and perch right out in the open uh, where they're very easy to photograph. One of our tamest large dragonflies. The eyes are just barely touching and they're blue. Uh, the females have this long ovipositor that they push eggs into the mud and streams with, why they're called spike tails. And very, very local, very poorly known. Again, small populations of them on Stossel Creek in King County here. And another very small family with one species only here, the river cruisers. Uh, the only dragonflies that have just a single stripe on the side of the thorax. Most of those with stripes have two stripes. This has only one. They have great big sort of purplish gray eyes, beautifully spotted abdomen. And they live on rivers in eastern Washington. One record of one from Mason County, never been found again there, uh, and scattered around the Columbia Basin on, on rivers. The emerald family, flowers that are by bright green eyes. Most of them have metallic bodies. This is an American emerald. It's fairly plain, plainly marked creature, but very common all over Washington. It's an early summer species, very common in June and into July. Mostly disappears after that in the wooded parts of the state. But they fly around the edges of lakes everywhere with big green eyes coming at you. And then the somatochlora genus, these uh, lined emeralds, or most of them have some sort of a pattern on the thorax. This one is the, the least pattern, probably, of all. <coughs> most of them have stripes or yellow spots on the thorax. They mostly occur in the mountains, as the name of this implies. Very abundant. If you go up into mountain lakes and have sedgy meadows around them, these things are just all over the place. They hover right in front of you with big green eyes. They're, fit, they're a little smaller than the darners. And there's five species of somatochlora, so there's whole bunch of different rare ones that occur in uh, various parts of the state. All five of them are known from bunchgrass meadows up in the northeastern part of the state. And the basket tails that come out in the spring, uh, brown dragonflies with greenish eyes, that they're flyers also, and they fly around in little feeding swarms sometimes over roads. So plain brown dragonflies back and forth over a road, almost surely are these basket tails. Call that because they have big, uh, subgenital plates here that are forked that hold a great big ball of eggs when they're laying their eggs and then they drag their abdomen through the water and the eggs come out in a string like toad eggs and this is a bunch of, ba of basket tail eggs laid by one female and they expand just like frog eggs do the gelatin, gelatin envelopes and then finally the last family the skimmers all of our pretty bright, <coughs> bright colored dragonflies that are perchers Many of them have patterned wings. They live in all the habitats, much the largest family of odonates in Washington. One of the really common ones here, this is another one that's known from all 39 counties, the eight-spotted skimmer with two spots in each wing. Mature males get white patches in the wings in addition to that. The four-spotted skimmer, another very common but plain brown dragonfly with pretty obvious spots in the wings that occurs mostly in wooded parts of the state, more common in the mountains than the lowlands. They're one of the most abundant northern dragonflies all across Eurasia and North America and the north. Uh, another very common species all across North America, the white tail, unmistakable with this very, very cruinose abdomen. The young males have an abdomen that looks just like that. And then as they mature, it gets whiter and whiter and they have a black band on each wing, a dark brown band. Totally different looking female with three spots in each wing. This is the one that loves mud. Perfectly happy in the mud muddiest lakes and ponds you can find. Is that a genus name change too? Uh, yeah. It was a <coughs> all along and then changed to Labellula and then they decided to split it out again. 
So nothing like the amount of changes that have happened in butterflies would keep me about five years behind in my butterfly scientific names. Uh, dragonflies, just a few changes like that have happened along the way. Uh, again, surely occurs in these two counties, but uh, these three counties, but I just don't have records of it yet. Uh, this is a female again, and a very similar 12-spotted skimmer, which is in eastern Washington, uh, easily distinguished by a different abdominal pattern. So, you know, just like birds, just like butterflies, you learn field marks for these things. They seem similar at first. Eventually, you can tell them apart. Sometimes live in different habitats, fly differently. It's like anything else in nature. The more you learn about them, the more comfortable you feel with them. Uh, another member of the same group with the, with the skimmers and the white tail, the chalk fronted corporal. This is another northern dragonfly. Lives around wooded lakes, very commonly uh, boggy lakes, and very common in the northeast, very common in the northwest. We've never found it in Okanagan County, which is the weirdest thing because, in fact, <coughs> Uh, as Richard said about Okanagan County, that's probably the richest county in Washington for dragonflies, too. There are more species known from King, but I think probably Okanagan has, has more species. But for some reason, it's very abundant species we have never been able to find there. So that, that could be the, the holy grail of dragonfly hunting, is find a, a, a chalk-fronted corporal. Unmistakable dark dragonfly with pruinos white thorax and abdomen base. And they perch on the ground very, very commonly. The white faces are small dragonflies, black, pure white faces. Uh, five species of those in Washington. And this is a, a very common one all over the state. It's an early spring species. Uh, another one with red, all the other species have red spotted abdomens, like this Hudsonian white face, very abundant in mountain bogs and, and lakes. And the meadowhawks, these little red dragonflies that you see all over the place. Ten species of them in Washington, nine of them are red, one is black. Uh, some of them can only be ID in the hand, especially the females. They're the only dragonflies uh, here that over deposit in tandem in flight. This is our other migrant dragonfly, the variegated meadowhawk. This dragonfly has been seen by the thousands in San Juan Island, in the Cascades, and on the outer coast in fall migration. In August, sometimes there are clouds of these moving down the coast. You never see anything like that in the spring. They just sort of appear suddenly in the spring. But in the fall, very, very large numbers of the ones that come in the spring lay their eggs, their larvae develop during the summer. They emerge in August, mostly, and fly south. Uh, we're also studying the species along with the common green yarner. Uh, all sort of dull red with two yellow spots. And the females are more brightly colored. But this is one of the commonest dragonflies in western Washington, the Cardinal Meadow. This is a brilliant red dragonfly you see in the spring and summer uh, all over the place. Yellow, also yellow spots, but much brighter red than the uh, um, irrigated meadowhawk. Mostly confined to western Washington, small populations at the edge of the, the mountains. This is the latest dragonfly at all. This is one that actually, this is actually incorrect. I forgot the changes. We've actually got December records of this now in the last couple of years. And it's the latest dragonfly all across North America. So little red dragonflies that you see in the fall. Uh, this is on the boardwalk at the Squally Refuge. You walk along that boardwalk in October. There are uh, uh, autumn meadowhawks sitting all over the, the uh, railing. Uh, striped meadowhawk, another very, very common member of this genus. These are pairs ovipositing in a dried up basin. This is one of the ones that lives in seasonal wetlands. And the pairs come together and obviously attract one another, and all these tandem pairs are dropping little eggs into the grass there, which will develop them when the water comes back in the winter. Two blue dragon, we're almost finished, two blue dragonflies, the western pond hawk, which has a green female, are only the only green skimmer <coughs> in Washington, and a bright blue crew and nose male. The male starts out just like that, and as it matures, it develops this blue Pruinosity, this powdery blue prune from pruin, prunus, the genus of plums. It's the same sort of idea as plums have on them. It's a ground percher. Uh, somewhat similar is the blue dasher. Not quite as blue, but has bright green eyes and a white face. This has dark green eyes and a green face. And very different females. And again, this just shows you uh, ontogenetic change. The, 
Uh, old female blue dasher gets pretty uh, dull. The young one is very brightly striped and marked. Some of these, both of these are southern species. They're missing from these sort of northern counties where a lot of the northern fauna and flora occurs. <clears throat> so that's a summary of the number of species known from Washington counties. It'd be interesting to compare that with the butterflies. Uh, very good counties, the northeastern ones, King, just because I've been doing it all the time. Kittitas, because it's also nearby, and I can get over there for uh, a lot of trips. Yakima, very, that was where the guy lived 100 years ago and already built up a pretty good list for that county. And the very poor counties, the Blue Mountains, because there really isn't a lot of water in the Blue Mountains, especially not lake and pond, lakes and ponds. Uh, these counties, number one, maybe not as well known, but also horrible weather. Again, we're bomb piled those. <laughs> and these are the flight seasons for damsel flies and then dragonflies on top of them. And you can see if you want to see the maximum number of species right around the end of July into August. So a pretty long time uh, in the midsummer when many of the dragons, remember there's only 80 species, so the vast majority of them are around in midsummer. And they're really, they, they go up sharply and they drop off sharply, more seasonal even than the butterflies. And two resources for Washington dragonflies. I know the author of both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend them. This one is you get from Seattle Audubon Society for seven dollars. <coughs> this one from Princeton mm -hmm. University Press for thirty. But in fact, you can get it from Amazon.com for twenty dollars, which, which is amazing to me. <laughs> but this is this is the uh, this is the uh, dragonflies light, and this is dragonflies heavy. <laughs> Uh, just the last finishing up, uh, we built our own habitat for dragonflies in our yard. Filled it up with uh, the butyl liner. Didn't even have hadn't even had a chance to cut the liner off. Put some went to the nursery, got some aquatic plants, and while we were filling it with water in the hose, this isn't the mirror, but a pair of cardinal meadowhawks came and started laying eggs in the pond. Basically, had need done the right thing. And this is after some year we discovered that the raccoons loved the pond. We had to put an electric fence around it, sadly, because they were just digging it up completely. But there are paddle tail darners hovering over it in the summer and damselflies living in it. <laughs> Catching them is a sport of kings, harder than butterflies. Unlike Butterflies, which you can put on your nose and not worry about a little piece of your nose being taken off. This is a predator. Remember that? So it's a little bit, adds a little bit more excitement when you've got a dragonfly. <laughs> uh, I've been studying it for a long time. I've never been tired of it. I have a collection of 60,000 of them in my dragonfly room in my basement. Which people say, oh my god. He's killed so many dragonflies. I think it comes to two dragonflies per species per year since I started doing this or something like that. This is the first dragonfly I ever photographed and the photograph of the dragonfly itself. This was 1960 in southern Florida at Ruiz National Park. I'm so happy I've got that picture still. And I really haven't grown up any because I'm still doing exactly the same thing. A little bit better camera equipment. Beautiful. And that's it. Thank you.